big day for our church. And, uh, and then also we're going to have, uh, we're starting Sunday school and children's ministries next week. So Gospel Tots, which is our nursery age preschool, they're going to be checked in downstairs. They'll get a wellness check. Uh, no visible signs of illness, runny nose, cough, fever. And then uh, the Gospel Kids will have a check-in up here uh, for those two Sunday school classes. And uh, same thing, a wellness check, and then they'll go into their classrooms. Junior church, if someone comes in between Sunday school and church, they'll also get checked in. And so we're just trying to be as safe as possible. And uh, we are asking the children to wear masks when they're in line, going from to and fro to the classrooms. But once they get in the classrooms, they're going to be distanced, and they can take their mask off. So um, we're just trying to do as much as we can. And thank you for your help. In making all this work because I know this is new to everyone and so uh, help us with that and if you need a mask we'll have masks for the adults we'll have masks for children uh, as they come in next week we're still going to use these double doors uh, for our main entry so if everybody could enter there that would help us out so much okay we'll give more information on how all that's going to work uh, but I just appreciate you uh, uh, helping us with that. Young Hearts is this Thursday. They're going to grill out hamburgers and hot dogs. You bring all the sides and the, the fixings, and then they'll eat in the fellowship hall. That's at 1130 this Thursday. And then uh, we're going to have a memorial service for Brother uh, Ronnie Grable. And of course, Joyce, raise your hand. I want everybody to, there you are, there you are. See, you're in a different spot, aren't you? Uh, uh, when did Ronnie pass? It was June? May 24th, okay. And we weren't able to have a service. We just did a graveside. And so the family would like to do a memorial service right here, September 19th. That's a Saturday, 1 o'clock. And we're going to do it right here in the auditorium. But then Joyce and her family are going to feed everybody that comes. Instead of us feeding them, she said, no, no, we're going to turn the tables. We want to feed you. So stay for that. Come. And uh, let's remember the life of Ronnie Grable and then stay for lunch afterwards. If you have not seen our nursery, we're going to have a little open house again today after the service. Head downstairs and see the nursery that God's blessed us with. And, of course, it will be open next week. We're so excited about that. All right, Brother Wes. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. If you'll stand with us this morning, we're going to sing a couple songs. We'll start with nothing but the blood. We'll stand and sing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus.
there, you'll know this next song. It's called Follow On. How many remember the song? Down in the valley with my Savior. Me and Barbara are going to sing this. No, <laughs> okay. All right, we're going to sing. If you don't know it, you'll pick it up by the time you get to the second verse. It's called Follow On. Amen. Rose, he arose. Y'all know that, right? 
we seem to have Easter. Remember Easter? We, 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 we didn't have our normal Easter this year, but we did it outside. We sang that song. He did songs like, How Can I Keep From Singing? All the Way My Savior Leads Me. The chorus to one of my favorite songs, We're Marching to Zion. He just took what Isaac Watts wrote and put the chorus on the end of it. He was born in 1826 in, in Pennsylvania. He lived uh, to 1899. He was 17 when he first he got saved and joined the church. In 22, he was called to, called to preach. In 28, at the age of 28, he graduated from the University of Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. And he went into being a pastor in 1849. And he pastored a number of churches all through that part of the country, in Brooklyn, New York, and Pennsylvania, until 1875, where he was referred to by everybody that ever wrote anything about him. I read this same phrase, a brilliant and entertaining speaker. That's something, if people can say that, does the man look entertaining at all to you? <laughs> he looks like he could be part of the James game, really. But anyway, a brilliant and entertaining speaker. So he's given us a lot of songs. His most famous song that he wrote, he didn't care much for after he wrote it. And I think it's so funny because he called it, uh, he called it marching music. He said, I, I wrote it, I put it to this time signature, and it sounds like something a marching band should play. Which is kind of funny because it became a big song during the temperance movement, and there was a lot of marching with the liquor down to the river to throw the river, the liquor into the river. He wrote this song, Shall We Gather at the River? <laughs> You can, you've already figured out what I thought about that. Let's stand and sing, Shall We Gather at the River? There you go.
wonderful to have my daughter here today and my grandson. Nine months old today. Where's he at? He's in my office sleeping, all right? But if y'all want to get a peek at it, we'll, I guess we'll be in the lobby afterwards. But uh, no touchy-touchy, but you can take a peek. <laughs> you know how that goes. But anyway, uh, it's a pleasure to have her. We love to sing as a trio, and this is a song that really touches my heart. And I uh, hope it will touch your heart today. Masterpiece.
we'll sing one more and give the pastor a chance to catch his breath a little bit. This is, uh, Mr. Lowry can take the credit for the tune to this song, but not the words. Let's stand and sing, I need thee every hour. I need thee. Say amen. Amen. 
Amen. All right. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Remember the story of the nation of Israel? They rebelled against God and had to be punished. God sent fiery serpents that bit the people, and many of the Israelites died. So it's a story about sin. Does that sound familiar? We're sinners as well. Amen? Amen. For all have sinned and come short. So that's a story about sin, but it's also a story about grace. Because Moses interceded for the people of God, and God provided a remedy. Does that sound familiar? What is our remedy? Say it. The cross. Amen. All right. That's the story of grace. And he told Moses, God told Moses to make a brass serpent. Y'all remember this. Lift it high on a pole for all to see. And any stricken people, if they had been bitten by a snake or by a serpent, that they could look at that serpent on the pole and they would immediately be healed. So although they had sinned, sin demands a punishment, that is also a wonderful story of grace. And God said, okay, I've I, I heard your prayer, Moses, and here's what I'm going to allow to happen. Make that bronze serpent, put it high for everyone to see, and when they look at, the, uh, at that serpent on the pole, they're going to be healed. So it's a story about sin, it's a story about grace, but then it's also a story about faith. Because the people had to look at that bronze serpent by faith. You know, they could have said, I don't believe that at all. I know I've heard this story about Moses putting the bronze serpent, but he just made that. What in the world? I'm not going to look at that serpent. So it took faith for them to look, and then they would be healed. So... You know, they were saved from physical death when they looked at the bronze serpent. Now, the serpent in Moses' day brought physical life to the Jews. But just like the uh, serpent was lifted up on that pole, the Son of God would be lifted up on a cross. Now, he was lifted up on the cross at his death. But he was also lifted up in his resurrection. Can I hear an amen? amen. We serve a risen Savior. And then he's going to be exalted. He is exalted right now in heaven. So he's lifted up in heaven. And one day we're going to bow before him. And uh, boy, he's exalted in glory even now. You say, well, Jesus lifted up, was lifted up on the cross. Why? To save us from our sin. To save us from spiritual death. He gives eternal life to anyone who trusts in him. How many have placed your faith and trust in Jesus? Amen. Amen. You looked to Jesus. Well, in the camp of Israel, the solution to the serpent problem was not in killing the serpents. Now, some of our guys would say, hey, preacher, I'll get them serpents. I can see Jamie Mock. Boy, he'd be excited about that. He'd go get his gun. He'd, he'd put traps out. He'd do anything he could to kill the serpents. That wasn't the remedy. It wasn't making medicine. Think about that. It wasn't pretending they weren't there. Oh, them serpents, they're really not there. No, it's not that. How about this one? Passing anti-serpent laws. <laughs> you think that would do the trick? It's kind of like uh, the deer crossing signs. Have you ever heard the joke about that? Man, don't put that sign there. That's a terrible place for the deer to cross there. You know, that's, that's not why that sign is there. Okay, I just want you to realize, we're not trying to tell the deer where to cross, but that, anyway, okay. I'll explain later if you didn't understand that, okay? But that was not the remedy. Passing new laws. How about this one? Climbing the pole. Some of y'all would have gone for that. <laughs> Let me climb the pole and I'll be healed. No, the answer was looking up by faith at the uplifted servant. And it's the same way when we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This whole world has been bitten by sin. 
the whole world. The wages of death is, I mean, so the wages of sin is death. Spiritual death. Being separated from God forever. That is the penalty for our sin. But God sent His Son to die for the whole world. We're saved from eternal punishment by looking to Him in faith. Now Jesus could have come to the world as a judge. He could have come to the world and destroyed every rebellious sinner. But in love, He came to the world as our Savior. And He died for us on the cross. Before I got saved, I was condemned already. Look at verse 18, the middle part of 18. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So before I was saved, I was condemned already. Condemned means to declare guilty of wrongdoing, to place judgment upon. What brought that condemnation upon me? Number one, sin. We've already established that. Number two, what's the penalty? Spiritual death. Eternity without Christ. In a place called hell. hell. Okay? Number three, did I deserve this condemnation? You bet I did because sin always brings judgment. I still deserve it. I want to do good, but I'm still flesh. How many can relate to Paul? He said, oh, the things I want to do, I don't. And the things I don't want to do, I do. Can you all relate to that? Yes. Man, I can. In my flesh dwells no good thing. All my righteousness is as filthy rags. I am condemned or was condemned because of my sinful nature. But then someone told me about John 3, 16 through 18. How many love this verse in God's word? Let's read it together. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. When I understood, that's the gospel in a nutshell, that through realizing my lost condition, that I could place my faith in Jesus, that I could be saved. I did that as a little boy. And I believed by grace, through faith, and I accepted Jesus as my Savior. Some, some of y'all did that when you were young. Some of you waited till later years. But at a point in your life, you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Now picture this. I'm standing before God to receive the just reward for my sin. The penalty for my sin. God, the divine judge, pronounces his verdict. Rather than condemnation, here's what we hear. Forgiven! Does that excite you? That's the verdict we hear because of what Christ did on the cross. His sacrifice grants remission. Y'all know that word? For our sin. Remission means forgiveness. Pardon. Y'all know that word? As it relates to the court system, someone gets pardoned. How about this one? Giving up of the punishment due to the crime. So in other words, even though I'm a sinner, I have been... Uh, Pardon for my sin, so I do not have to pay the punishment due to my crime of sin. In other words, the righteous judge declares me not guilty. The righteous judge grants me a divine acquittal. Have you heard that word before? It's right there on the screen. That's the title of the message. The divine acquittal. That's what we receive from God, the righteous judge. Now, acquittal means to clear of a charge as to declare someone not guilty, set free by judgment of the court. Now, i got good news. God's justice system has no court of appeals by Satan. He can't come in 
and try to, uh, you know, take your salvation away. Once you are saved, you are always saved. Amen? So this God's court system has no court of appeals. Praise God, I'm not condemned anymore. Look at verse, verse 18, the first part. Say it with me. He that believeth on him is not condemned. You ought to shout right there. Say amen. Woo! That's right. Good. Now, that's the divine equivalent. He that believeth on me is not condemned. We've been found not guilty. We've been set free. We've been granted acquittal by the righteous judge. Now, the most famous acquittal in my lifetime was O.J. Simpson. How many know him? Football star, movie actor. He was tried for the 1994. Did y'all realize it's been that long ago? 26 years the trial took place. Or that's when the murder took place. Tried for the 1994 murder of his ex-wife and her friend. It was the most publicized criminal trial in American history. How many remember turning on the TV and watching the police follow that Bronco down the California highways? The most bizarre thing, uh, you know, that we had ever seen at that time. Now, we've seen a lot more bizarre stuff since then, I guess. But at that time, well, that was huge. But y'all remember the story after a very lengthy trial lasted over nine months. Woo! Seemed like every time you turn on the TV, just like now, every time you turn on the TV, COVID, Back then, every time you turn on the TV, OJ was on there. He was acquitted. How many remember this? The glove argument. If it does not fit, you must acquit. Y'all remember that? I mean, that was the famous line. Now, I know most of us have been acquitted on occasion. How about when you're driving down the road and all of a sudden you see a blue light special in your rear view mirror? <laughs> Now, I know some of you ladies, y'all can turn on the tears in a second. <laughs> and then I bet the cops have heard every story on, you know, under God's uh, green earth or blue earth, whatever. I mean, they've heard it all. And most of you ladies, I know how you're going to react. You start, you start crying. But, I mean, we've sweet talked. Come on. Are you with me? We've denied. We've, we've schemed. Man, we've had a sob story. And then the cop comes back, and uh, many times he'll give you a warning if you had a, a good record. In other words, you've been acquitted. Now, I remember on occasion I've been stopped, and man, you know, I don't normally fight with them or justify. I know I messed up, okay? I was going too fast. And I just hand him the license, and he goes back to his or license and registration. He goes back to his cruiser. And all the time, what are you doing? What am I doing? We're praying, God, please. <laughs> I don't want to pay that hundred dollars, at least a hundred now, maybe two hundred. And I don't want to go to driving school, or I don't want it to affect my insurance. And man, we are crying out to God, please help me. And then there'll be a case where you'll come back and he'll say, You need to sign this. I'm like, okay. But there's other times, and boy, I have been blessed on many occasions. Where you'll come back and say, buddy, just be more careful. I'm just going to give you a warning. And you, you're not going to believe what happens. All the way home, I am shouting. Amen? Because I was acquitted. How many have experienced that? How many would say, I never got a warning. I got nailed every time. <laughs> My wife's hands up. She's only been stopped once. I mean, on her first time of ever getting a ticket, right here in Roanoke, no warning. She had to go to driving school. I mean, she got the book thrown at her. Okay. <laughs> That's just the way it goes. <laughs> but I tell you, I'm glad on those occasions that I was acquitted. And I'm glad it was only a traffic violation. Amen. And maybe some of y'all have been through some other stuff. But Jesus gives us some benefits from this divine acquittal. You say, preacher, what are some benefits of me being acquitted? Well, I've got three for you this morning. If you're taking notes, write them down. Number one, we've been acquitted from the prison of no peace. Before you got saved, did you have a lot of peace in your heart? 
And you say, well, think about it now. Have you ever heard this? N-O Jesus, N-O peace. No Jesus, no peace. Have you heard that? How about this? K-N-O-W Jesus, K-N-O-W peace. No Jesus, no peace. Now, how many have the K-N-O-W? Amen? I know Jesus, so therefore I know what peace is all about. You know, I love Romans 5, 1. You don't have to turn there. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through who? Through our works? Through myself? No. It's through my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's how I have peace. And by the way, that, that, that verse uses that word justified again. Praise the Lord for that. But I no longer live under the fear of judgment. I no longer live under the fear of the wrath of God. So you know what that does for me? Does it do this for you? Woo, that gives me peace. I can lay down my head on my pillow at night and rest in Jesus, knowing that he has paid my sin debt and I am on my way to heaven and there's nothing I can do to lose it. Woo, woo, you're talking about peace in my life. And he'll give it to all of us. I tell you, before we got saved, though, we searched for peace. And we tried to find it. It's the longing of our heart, but only Jesus can fill our hearts with peace. He gives me peace that I'm eternally saved, but he also gives me peace that I'm in his will. How many glad that in Christ you're no longer in the prison of no peace? You can have peace in your life. Now, the opposite of peace is worry. Boy, the last six months, people have been worry warts. I'll just tell you. And, and that is the opposite of peace. Here's how we do it. To keep the peace of God, I must obey the God of peace. Are you with me? Let me repeat that. To keep the peace of God, I must obey the God of peace. What he says is in Philippians. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, what does it say? Think on these things. Do you know our stinking thinking leads to a lot of our worries? It starts here in your brain. And your thinking is going to mess you up. You've got to learn to dwell on positive things and the only thing he asked me to do is think right and then he'll protect my heart and mind. Think about this, Isaiah 26, 3, you know it. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. That means you cannot be constantly watching the TV and getting your mind wrapped up in the things of this world and keep your sanity. Keep your peace. No, you have to dwell in the secret place and get into God's word and let him cleanse your mind and renew it daily. And when you renew your mind, he's going to keep you in perfect peace because your mind's in the right place. You're thinking on the right things. Things that are true and honest and just and pure and lovely and good report. Things that have virtue. Things that have praise. That's what you're thinking. Then you can have the peace of God in your heart. How about... Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, what's the rest of it? Shall keep your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Christ is the one that makes it possible for us to have peace. Do you have peace in your heart this morning? Don't raise your hand. Do you truly have peace? Don't worry. God's in control. Don't live in fear. Live by faith. And think on the right things through the washing of the word. Boy, the, the word is like a spiritual shower, a spiritual bath. It'll wash us. It'll make us clean. And then we'll think the right things and we'll have the peace of God. So I'm glad that I've been acquitted from the prison of no peace. Number two, I've also been acquitted from being on death row. Now, on death row this morning, if you were to go to the prison, the fed, probably federal prison, 
There are men and women that are on death row just waiting to die. Here's my point this morning. I don't have to worry and fear about physical death. Amen? Bob, you told me on several occasions. I'm ready to go. There, there's nothing to fear about dying physically. Because I'll close my eyes here and I'll open them in glory. What's wrong with that? Amen? We don't have to worry about death. You know, believers are found in either one of two places. Either in heaven, after they die. Or... Uh, they're, they're here. Uh, they can be found right now. Believers are either in heaven or right here alive on the earth. They're not in the grave. Are you with me? That's just their bones and dust and, and their, their, their shell, right? Their body. Believers are not in hell. Can I hear an amen there? Amen. Yes. And believers are not in an intermediate place between earth and heaven. I'm glad we don't have to wait. The Bible says we are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Does that sound good like good news this morning? I have been acquitted from being on death row. I don't have to worry about death. I feel sorry for folks who believe this is all there is. I'm going to live my life to the fullest. And then I'm just going to go to the grave and just rot. And that's it. No, your spirit, your soul is going to live somewhere forever. Amen. Well, I've got more to go to heaven for than I did yesterday. Amen. I'm looking forward to it. Every day I live here, there's more to look forward to in going to heaven. My body's not waiting to die on death row. It's waiting to be glorified. So I don't have to worry about physical death. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. You got to see this. 1 Corinthians 15. Some of y'all know this and you know where I'm going. Verse 55. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. In other words, it's the mirror. The law is the mirror that shows us that we're sinners. Okay? Verse 57, read it with you. Ready? But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We're going to live forevermore with Jesus. I don't have to worry about physical death. Jesus tells me, hey, I'm your shepherd. I'm not only going to lead you through this life, I'll lead you through the, the deep waters of death. And then I'll bring you into eternity. See, for Christians, death is just the passing of our spirit from this life to the next. The leaving of earth and going to be with our Savior. So you know what? One day I'm going to put my hand in his nail-scarred hands. And he's going to lead me to the other side. There is no need to worry or fear about death. See, in Christ... Through his death on the cross, we got victory over death. Death's sting is removed. It's kind of like a bee when it gets stung. And a lot of times the stinger will stay in your skin. How many have experienced that? That bee will never be able to sting anybody again. All right? So we don't have to worry about that. In Christ's victory, death's sting is removed. It is declawed, defanged, disarmed, and destroyed. Amen? Amen? We don't have to worry about death. So I've been acquitted from being on death row. I've been acquitted from the prison of no peace. Number three, and I'm done. We've also been acquitted from an eternal life sentence without God. We have been acquitted from an, from an eternal life sentence without God. I'm going to have you turn to one more place. Turn to 1 Corinthians. I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5. Look at verse 9. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. You know what that means? Condemnation. Now wait a minute. I was condemned before I got saved. That's true. But now I'm no longer under condemnation. 
For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Whether we die first or whether we live until his coming. How many want to live until his coming? Wouldn't that be a great way to go, right? But either way, we're going to live together with him. Either you're going to go through death or you're going to be alive when he comes back. Look at verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. Edify one another. Encourage one another as even as also ye do. Hey, I don't have to worry about the wrath of God. I don't have to worry about condemnation. I don't have to worry about an eternal life sentence without God in a place called hell. That's what spiritual death is. Separated from God forever. Now there's a death chamber. That is a room where condemned prisoners are executed. One day, there will be a room where those who have rejected Jesus will receive final judgment. Revelation 20, verse 10. Y'all remember this? And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's who hell was made for, right? The devil, false prophet, the beast. Now listen, verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That is the eternal life sentence without God. And I don't wish that upon anyone. God doesn't wish it upon anyone. God's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Praise God, I won't be in that death chamber. I've escaped this terrible judgment by trusting Jesus as my personal Savior. I have received the divine acquittal. How many of you are excited about that too? Say, I've, I've received that divine acquittal. He saved me. He loves me. He keeps me. I'm going to see him face to face one day. I've been acquitted from the prison of no peace. I've been acquitted from being on death row, physical death. But then I've also been acquitted from an eternal life sentence without God. I will not face spiritual death. I have spiritual life in Christ for all eternity. Well, if you're thankful about that today, we need to be praising God. Now, if you're here today, by the way, let me just say something about hell. Hell is a witness to the righteous character of God. He has to judge sin. It's in his nature. Okay? Number two, hell is a witness to man's responsibility. Man is able to make a choice. He either accepts Jesus or he rejects Jesus. That's why people will go to hell because of, they, they, of unbelief. They reject Jesus. The offer of salvation from Jesus. And then hell is also a witness of the awfulness of sin. Man, if we saw sin the way God did, wow, we would understand why there is a place called hell. So it is justified, but I'm just glad. Are you glad you're not going to be going there? Amen. Amen. So I, I've been acquitted from that. Now, if you're here today, or if you're listening, by way of the internet, if you're unsaved, it's not like you're at a trial. And God's just waiting for you to give your final argument. Let's pretend we're in a trial and everybody has their closing argument. Okay, God, this is why you want to let me into heaven. I've been a good boy. That's not what it is at all. You're already condemned. If you're unsaved, you're already condemned. It's like you're in prison waiting for execution. But the gospel tells us that the pardon is being offered to you. Will you accept the pardon? Will you accept the divine acquittal? Don't refuse it. Accept the sacrifice for your sins. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. I pray to God that this message has just been an encouragement to you. If you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you've received the divine acquittal, and you can shout all the way home this afternoon. 
But I tell you, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, get it settled today. Place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But don't refuse the pardon. Accept the forgiveness through the sacrifice that Jesus made on your behalf on the cross. Lord, thank you for this time that we've had in your word. It's been encouraging. Thank you for that divine approval. And we love you, Lord. Thank you for your blessings upon our church. Continue to, to prosper and bring us back together more week by week. Lord, protect us. Um, help us to be wise. Help us to try to reach our neighbors for Christ. And Lord, we realize you're in control. And Lord, we're thankful for the divine approval today. In your name I pray.